Generally Famous is proudly brought to you by Trade Depot. Generally famous for bathrooms, kitchens and appliances. Call into one of the stores or visit online at tradedepot.co.nz. Kia ora, I'm Simon Bridges and this is Generally Famous and I am very excited today to have uh, with us Kim Crossman uh, who is all the way from, or virtually in Santa Monica, a Kiwi actor from local fame on Shortland Street, the Hollywood Boulevard, author, podcast, a marine biologist, um, the, the project's LA correspondent and lover of tarantulas. Kim, it is so good to have you on Generally Famous. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Love, great intro too. I need you to go in every room before me and just so people are like, hey. <laughs> okay, you <laughs> know, what's yourself? the pay like? Under deliver. I love it. This is going to be great. And I... And I know the answer, but I feel like it's important because I was the, probably the most stressful thing for me mm. in getting ready for this was asking, uh, are you Kim Kimberly? I mean, th- th- these are important things. Oh, it's not important to me. I am happy for you to land on whatever feels comfortable. I'm going to go Kim because it's one syllable. Great. And I feel like that will work. Um Generally famous is what this podcast is. What, what does fame mean to to and for you as as an actor it's such a yuck word isn't it it's like I feel like fame is it's like the word influencer it's a bit like comes out of your mouth a bit like ooh yuck oh yeah (laughs) oh influence is worse though because the influence is a bit sort of earnest or something yeah but I think fame is too fame feels like and maybe this is a New Zealand POV but it seems a bit yuck. It seems like, oh, you didn't do anything. You're just kind of lucked it. I don't know why that feels yuck, but I I don't know. How do I define it? I would I would hate to be called famous. <laughs> um I guess I would like to I'd like to be a good role model. That would be good. But I wouldn't I wouldn't ever say that I would be chasing fame. Like I have no interest in fame. Do I have interest in having influence or my voice carrying meaningful weight or being, um, I don't know, someone in the space that people could look up to? Then that, yeah, of course, which I guess would be. Or significance. Yeah. In what you're doing and your body of work and yeah. what it's about. And- yeah, I guess known or entertaining that would be a better word for it um I don't know why I feel so repulsed by it I think people have ruined the word fame because we've seen so many people chase it just because they want that 15 minutes I guess Uh, yeah but well everyone has it that 15 minutes or whatever it is um and uh so that is it and but you were so let's not let's not say fame uh well I'm sure I will we can we can say I'm just in this chat but 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 let's go sort of limelight you you were in the limelight I want to say from I don't know technically what the age of a child is but as a child I mean you did ballet with what the NZSO or the Royal Ballet or something you were um cheerleading which I know from my education on Netflix is this intense sort of weird kind of world um and then you were on Shortland Street Mm -hmm. so you were um you were in this small pond of Aotearoa New Zealand but you, you were really in the limelight yeah, but also I love attention. So if I if the spotlight is on me, I'll take it. <laughs> like that is my goal at all times, be so entertaining that you can't look away. Um, so no, I love attention and I love performing and I love entertaining. Just something about that word fame means that it feels like I'm chasing it for validation where it's yeah. like, no, it just my skill set and what I love is to bring people joy. So in any facet that I can do that, whether it's dance, acting, hosting, presenting, podcasts, yeah, then that of course I, I and love. And were you the same? Are you the same off camera or off stage then on, or does a light switch? I heard someone say recently that they'd met name dropping, admittedly, but they'd met Bill Clinton, and um, he was a bore off the sort of camera. But as soon as it went on, he was kind of. Oh, I mean, is that? I'm not calling you a bore, but it, it, does something happen when you're on the? in the moment oh I think there's an element of intensity when you know that there's an element of hyper focus so I would say that I'm addicted to the moment between action and cut because Mm. I have depression and anxiety so anytime I'm alone 
I would say that I'm either usually in my anxiety about the future or in my depression of the past. So between action and cut is that time where I can quiet my mind and be hyper-focused. And perhaps you maybe have found this in your line of work, like when you're in that spotlight or all the attention is on you, you're just in this hyper-focused state of flow. And I love, I thrive for that feeling. I am addicted to it. Am I high energy and just a little intense and this energetic around my family and friends? A hundred percent. But I will say (laughs) there is another version of me, which is a quieter version. And usually I reserve that for moments alone. It's my least favorite version of me, but it's my time of reflection. It is a quieter version and I'm trying to learn to let people in and love that part of me as well. But it is, it's the boring part of me, the worrisome part of me. Um, Are you comfortable being alone or in that quiet moment? I would say historically, no. And I think that's why I had, when I was diagnosed with depression, I realized that, oh, this is something that I've avoided. My brand of depression presents itself as busy lady syndrome. I keep myself busy. I keep myself around people because I would find in those moments alone, all these feelings would come up, some stuff I hadn't deal with would come up. So I would just avoid it. What I'm trying to learn and learning through talk therapy and other forms of therapy is that what you don't deal with will deal with you. Mm. So I've had to force myself to like sit through some of that uncomfortability and work through some of that stuff that bubbles up so that I can be a little bit more ease. I'm living alone for the first time in just over 30 years. So that's been interesting to see how I'm learning to now enjoy my own company and really take time to recharge. But it's been a journey. Are you an introvert, extrovert or extrovert, extrovert? I'm I'm an introvert. Um, I uh, I like people. I um, enjoy. It doesn't mean I'm shy. Clearly, and like you and the the professions I've chosen, but um, I am de-energized by people. Um, if you want to put it that way. And after the end, I I want to. I mean, my ideal state is being in a room by myself with a book. But knowing that, like my wife and family are kind of there, yeah. and you know, I could call on them if I want, yeah. and you know, that's it, it, everything to extreme has pro- probably got its negatives. But that's kind of how I am. I, I want to take you. I want to take you back, and I, I appreciate it's been a while. That's fine. How old were you when you first went on? You were first on Shortland Street. Yeah, so I had just turned sixteen, so I was Amazing. a little. Well, I, I thought I was like old and mature, but. <laughs> In hindsight, <laughs> yeah, young, yeah. yeah. And and I, I look, I, I have a blurb here. I think from the time you were Sophie Mackay, a quote very pretty, popular fifteen-year-old, a typical teen consumer of any new product or trend. She's a total fashion victim. <laughs> That's what it said. And then it, I know yeah. uh, from the character and what I know, you had relationships. You had a secret affair with the guy from Coronation uh, child Street. Wide. How do you look back? on that time or don't you no I always do I I really think of my chapter I mean I did seven years on Shorten Street so it's a long time in any job I mean maybe not for our parents generation but for us you know that's a really long time to be in a workplace and I I look at it extremely fondly I feel like I grew up I mean, I physically did, but I really was kind of a, I felt like a child thrown into an adult world. You know, I was working, I was the youngest cast member at the time. Um, I had to grow up pretty fast. I definitely look upon it fondly. There are elements that I think were just of the time. I mean, this is circa 2005, 2006. So it was a very different time then. And I think there are certain checks and balances just with being on the telly that would be different now for 15 and 16 year olds than it was for my experience. Like my first publicity was (laughs) a swimwear shoot and I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm getting my makeup done. I'm wearing swimwear. And then unbeknownst to me, a few months later, I was the cover and a center pullout of performance car magazine. Now I don't think that would happen to many 16 year olds now, but you can imagine like that was my first, experience um which was yeah not great my parent my mother cried you know like I just was I felt like I was a little over sexualized yes for what myself Kimberly was comfortable with again I was paid to do a job and I was consenting to do the job I just 
I feel now with my maturity or the times have changed a little bit, I'm not sure some of those situations would have happened. Um, or, do you re- I don't want to say regret because like my sense is you don't at all regret it, but I mean. No, not at all. I think it's part I, I, of my story and yeah. I'm happy with it and I'm comfortable with it. I think just what I'm saying is, is 2005, 2006 was a very different time than yeah. 2022. Um, so if I look back at it, I think there are some th- certain things that come with anyone coming of age. You know, maybe it's not that you're on a magazine, but maybe you're in a situation, you know, we all have different ways of growing up. I was just doing mine really publicly and on a trajectory that was a lot faster than my peers. I um, I presume, I'm sure, if we go cast your mind back to then, mm-hmm. you would have had, you know, other teenagers, people older than you coming up to you on the street. I mean, I, I think we were, that's pre-selfie time. So maybe that it was, was you know, I had that a wasn't... digital camera. I was taking <laughs> selfies, but I was of the new age. Yeah. Right, right. But I mean, so you were, I, I, I'm going to say it, even though I'm turning this into a thing that's not a thing, but... I mean, you were famous in New Zealand. Um, was it amazing? Was it awful? I was on an accelerated path. So I was also going out to bars. I was allowed in bars. When I say allowed, I was going into them and I wasn't turned away, but I was yeah. underage. Um, Even though, ironically, they should have known your, your age or they could have, well, I suppose they didn't have smartphones then either. Probably. So they, yeah. Um, you know, and I think it was really cool. I I felt really cool at the time. But you're right. When hindsight's a little different, you know, I was, I wasn't good at handling alcohol. I would have certain experiences where, I mean, again, this is a different time. Facebook was a thing. MySpace was a thing. I had a Bebo page. It wasn't like we were having this interaction with actors. So a lot of people in the general public would call me Sophie and think I was my character. So if I would do something and I was a bit bratty and materialistic as a character, which is a very, um, very different from me, Kim, the human. Mm. Uh, so I would have experiences or people would want to argue with me or have a go at something just because they were treating me as if I was my character. So I made a very conscious decision at 18 to be sober and not be around alcohol right. Um, right. at all. I didn't have the maturity to handle it at 16 and 17 and have these discussions with people. And so I made a decision to be sober. My sister and I decided to set myself up as a brand and become Kimberly Crossman rather than Sophie Mackay and really kind of took the power back to try and set myself up for a career that has longevity rather than always being that character and people's POV being that what my character does, Kim does. So I really was trying to make a separation around that. And I think taking some of that control was helpful. Did I have fun being underage and all my friends going out and getting drinks and meeting the all blacks and doing cool stuff? Of course, I had a wonderful time. Um, But in hindsight now, yeah, I just, I had, I didn't have the maturity to know that I was putting myself in situations that would feel unsafe or unhealthy or not good for me. Because I presume there were a lot of perks that went with it. I mean, everywhere you yeah, went. Yeah, you get so much free stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. great. Best free thing you got? Anything spring to mind? A trip to, for my whole family to go to Vegas Amazing. with um, grab a seat. Right. I thought it was a joke. And they're like, do you guys want to come on this chartered plane to Las Vegas? My whole family went. It was amazing. And then, though, you, you know, after seven years, you're, what, what, what age do you leave Shortland Street? Um, I believe I was like 22. I'd had my 21st birthday. I was 22, 23, and I made the decision to move to America. Yeah. What, why'd you leave? You had it all. You know, as you say, you were getting free drinks. Um, and, you know, I'm being slightly, well, many, very glib about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, cool. and there's the All Blacks. There's all these things. You're getting the trips to Vegas. You are... The shining star and uh, I accept a small country. What? Why? Because I went in 2010, I went on a trip to, um, to here, to America for Nickelodeon and did a job where I got to meet people my own age who were working here and 
just for the first time in my life, it felt like that pipe dream of working on these big scale TV shows seemed really possible. I felt like I related to the people I was interviewing with. They felt like my people. And that just planted the seed to me that anything was possible and I just needed to dream a little bigger. So I never left Shorten Street being like, I'm over it. I could still be there and be blissfully happy, like you say, getting some free stuff and (laughs) meeting athletes, like, great. But, Mm. you know, I... It's like any job. I felt like I had learned all the lessons I could learn in that environment for that chapter of life I was in. And I'm a hungry girl with a lot of ambition and a lot of drive. I want to see the world. I don't want to just be Mm. doing the same thing all the time. And yes, Shortland Street's amazing, but I wanted to do different roles. I wanted to do comedy. Like, I think I'll never be one to take the safe option. Would full-time employment sound delightful to me right now? Of course. Mm. But I would be an unhappy half human if I didn't take the risks that I take. With big risk comes big reward. And in the last decade since I've left Shorten Street, I've lived a full life. I've met amazing people. I've traveled the world. So I don't have any regret about that. And the people that I worked with for those seven years are still some of the nearest and dearest to me. So I feel really positive about it. Fantastic. And look, the most significant, uh, important question I've asked so far, do you still watch Short on Street? Yeah, when I'm home, of course, because <laughs> my friends are on. Yeah. Of course. Can I... I think we can be incredibly proud of it. Everyone kind of like rolls their eyes at it. But that was my, I, it has such a, you, we wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for Shortland can, Street, you know? Can I, can I, can I make a confession just between you and I? Like, don't put it on a podcast or anything like that. I've never watched Shortland Street. You're a liar. I, it's been on I, in the room. I assure somewhere. you, I have never, I, I, can, I have certainly never sat through a full, uh, program and that's not because I'm anti it or anything. They just kind of is. I, I don't. So so can you? Uh, firstly, well, Tell you first, what, first loosely based medical drama. I mean, f- firstly, am I less of a kiwi? Am I? I mean, is this like never having had marmite and toast or 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 jaffas or? Have you watched Lord of the Rings? Yes, it's very long. Actually, I don't know if I got to the end of it. I think I did. I don't want. To... I don't think. I mean, you're one of New Zealand's most well-known people. I don't think you can ever be less New Zealand. So you're fine. Um, I think you should give it a nudge. You might like it because it is. I mean, it's our coronation street. It's our neighbours. Yeah. Albeit neighbours has just died, but that's right. Shorten Street will go on for eternity, and as it should. And it employs so many beautiful people. So. Wonderful um, cameo for you, future cameo. You come back as I don't know. Older, well, I'm not dead. Wiser um, Sophie, who's travelled the world. Wouldn't it be more fun if it's like? Wouldn't it be more fun if you know I'm an addict and I've just let myself go? <laughs> I'm a bit like, yeah. well, like, wouldn't that be more interesting? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I suppose there's you know there's interest in that darkness. Um, and then you went. To- You've got to go from somewhere. You've got to start something, and then they can rehabilitate me and get me yeah. back to the. We all knew. Yeah, no, it could happen. Um, and then it's Hollywood. Um, what is it like? <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got like right. 19. Where do we go? I know. You know what? I LA is like a bad boyfriend. So it can treat <laughs> you really mean that you keep coming back to it. It's like a toxic relationship. When it's good, it's so good. And when it's awful you are just in a ball on the floor and as soon as you try to leave that's when it's like oh, fine I'll I'll give you something and if you strangle it nothing happens so it's I'm really in relationship with Los Angeles and right now it's going great has it been shitty in the past of course has it been painful have I cried yes but right now it's pretty and, good. and I presume that the people are both the best and the absolute worst that humanity has to offer I mean is that a this is an interesting statement I went through quite a big like well, from someone who's been in parliament right it's <laughs> sorry you were saying well you know what I went to I spent a lot of time in the church here in LA as well. And something that was said in a sermon once was that 
you know, L.A. is no different than any other city. It's just got a camera on it. So we love seeing the worst of the worst that come out of Hollywood. Yes. The, you know, the plastic Barbies who are just absolute see you next Tuesdays. But Auckland has those people too. Yeah. Wellington has those people yeah. too. Just we, we shine a light on it in Hollywood. But I will say this. There is more ambition in this city than anywhere else. If you want to get inspired, come here because everyone you walk into has left their small town, whether it be in New Zealand, Australia, or even in America, because they're chasing some kind of dream and they are crazy enough to think it can happen. And in this city, people's dreams come true every day. So it's there's a really cool energy here that I feel like New Zealand could, we could learn a bit from that. I think we're a little trepidatious with being, you know, sharing our goals, sharing our passions, because we don't want to offend someone or we're, we don't back ourselves yeah. 100%. Whereas here, everyone backs themselves and it's quite exciting. And people are more good looking, let's be honest. <laughs> I mean, that is true, right? I mean, I literally, I, I say that, I, I, talking to you, I have quite literally, and literally is a word that gets overused and I think probably wrongly used, but come from having a pie because I was in a hurry and you know but I wouldn't get away with that in Los Angeles of course would you would. I think that's a horrible misconception have you seen the portion sizes that they feed people right. here in America yeah my goodness yeah um, is there a big culture of health and well-being and appearance yeah but that's because most people are trying to get a job on the telly and it usually <laughs> you know that invokes some kind of self-care mm. but that's fine. As long as pe- the prettiest people shine from the inside. Yeah. You're very beautiful, Simon. Yeah, thank you. Well. Whether you eat pies before interviews or not. We're all beautiful to someone. And in a podcast, I'm very beautiful, right? So <laughs> let's leave that there. Oh, oh, one thing I want to take you up on, um, uh, and again, it's a very serious matter, but I, I was perplexed. And I know you sort of, um, you explain it away in the opening of your um, uh, of your podcast, but you, you have like 18 different accents. You know, talking to me, you sound more like a Kiwi. When you've got a fully fledged yank there, you go full yank on me. I do go full yank. But I would, all Kiwis do this. And Americans do it around British people too. I'm a chronic mimicker. And I think too, I always like to make sure that people can understand me. And when I'm speaking to Americans, I know that they historically have quite an issue really hearing the New Zealand accent. Are you? I suspect I know the answer. Are you, are you still a Kiwi? Of course. I have just applied for my US citizenship, though, so at some point I'll be a little right. bit of both. But, yes, I, <laughs> I will always be, and I'm very proud to be a Kiwi. And I do want to, like, also give credit to people like Taika and Reese Darby who have, like, so helped me in my career here. I'm starting to go for auditions, and they're like, no, no, you can do it in a New Zealand accent, which is never happened before right i used to go into auditions and my agents would be like don't you dare say you're not from america like they need to hire you first then they do all the paperwork so in all seriousness would you say there is a tiger effect and you've you, you have felt that and as much as oh he's God. there he is the big time i mean i mean those thor movies have got kiwi characters um with kiwi expressions and 100%. I'm so grateful for, you know, and Reese as well, who just vehemently refuses to do any other accent other than New Zealand. So I'm so grateful that I get to reap the benefits because I want to speak like this. It's just because I also look American or I'm often trying to audition for a daughter or a sister. Then obviously I can't be the random person in the family who has a foreign accent. Um So I have to master an American accent, but where I'm playing like a best friend character or it doesn't matter where I'm from and it doesn't need explaining, then I've had more permission to be from New Zealand, which is really cool. Is there a a Kiwi mafia in Hollywood? Um, Or or, or if not mafia, a a, a group that looks out for each other? Of course there is, a real Kiwi contingent, a little family. I was actually just at a barbecue with a lot of them yesterday, um, which was super cool. So we take care of each other. I become like the mule, so I bring back Toffee Pops, Marmite, because I go back and forth the most. Don't, I was going to say, don't say that to customs. Whatever you do, <laughs> that's not going to go well, okay? I, I know what they say about rock and roll and movies. and Oh, I yeah. get stopped at every airport anyway because I'm a pretty girl travelling alone. They're like, someone's got to have given her something. So <laughs> I've like got that's yeah, very, every, That's not fair. Yeah. 
every every airport they're like this is ridiculous so there is a mafia you are part of it <laughs> and do you, i must do, be do they, do they text, so and they text you with toffee pops is basically yeah. what you've told me yeah, toffee pops, marmite, pineapple lumps, and Whitaker's old gold peppermint chocolate seem to be the most desired um, of the confectionery. Recently, Natalie and I have moved from Tauranga to Auckland as we embark on our new life with our three kids, Emlyn, Harry, and Jemima. And so in doing that, yep, we bought a few things from home, our old home, but we've also needed to make the odd purchase or two. And in looking for a dryer, I look no further than Trade Depot. What I loved about Trade Depot was three things. It's 100% Kiwi owned, and that matters to me as a proud Kiwi. Secondly, it's the product range. Over 4,500 top quality home improvement products. So much range, so much choice. And finally, you know with Trade Depot, you'll always get a great price. Low prices, always. So when you're out there, maybe you've moved or maybe you just need something new for your kitchen, for your bathroom, go to Trade Depot. It's New Zealand's largest online home improvement store. It has free delivery with minimum spends in Auckland, Hamilton and Christchurch. T's and C's of course apply. Check out tradedepot.co.nz or call into one of their three stores in Auckland, Christchurch or near the airport in Hamilton at their new superstore. I'm so, it's so superficial, but I am superficial, so I'm going to ask you this. Who, who, are the, who are the most famous actors you've met? Who are the ones that stand out? You say, oh my, here I am in a room and across the floor is blah. Well, I live in the very blessed simulation or reality, whichever one I'm in, where <laughs> I have this thing. I mean, at some level, it's going to be a simulation, right? It's like that I, Jim Carrey show, which I can't even think what it's called, but yeah. The Truman Show? You're, yeah, that's it. You're being the, the strings are being pulled. It's not real. I think so. None of this is. I, mean, I have the best job with the project where almost every week I get to interview the biggest stars, whether it be on Zoom or in person. So I've met almost everybody and that I care about and some cool up and coming. My most exciting for me personally would probably be Will Ferrell because I've interviewed him a few times. He gives a great interview. Mm -hmm. It's one of my life goals and I've got a few of them. We can dissect them later if you want. The top one is living in a castle. The second one is owning a Maine Coon. And the (laughs) third one is to have a cup of tea with the Queen. But the fourth one on the list. The second one one is achievable. Actually, they're all achievable. The Queen, you're running out of time, my friend, but. Oh, I've been trying. I've sent her over 50 letters. I have sent the Queen. I have got New Zealand House involved. I've tried everything to meet that woman. That's intense. I'm an intense kind of woman. So <laughs> I'm getting if that we're just fe- learning this I'm, now I'm, after 29 I'm, minutes. I'm getting that feeling. <laughs> uh, but Will Ferrell is, I just want to work opposite him. Like right. from everything I know and all the people I've interviewed, he's the least and most self-aware human. He's just funny on a level that we can't compute. And all I've wanted when I've interviewed him is for him to look at me and kind of go, you're really funny. You should come and be in a movie. And every time an interview ends, I hold it there for a bit longer. I'm like, please say it, please say it. And then they usher me out and I'm like, damn. But one of these days it will happen. I hope. You're, you're, so forget the, fame thing there it is again you can say the word i've but made you self-conscious you we'll use the voices, word fame. That's right. but put that aside who, who if, and they can be dead alive half alive oh. as an actor yes when you think about actors who, who would you say is the most complete the best a- actor of all time The best act. No pressure. All time. That's so. No pressure. I'm, I'm, I'm tweeting it straight after this. No, I reckon I stand by Will Ferrell. I think that he's made me laugh in a way that is just so joyous. He's brilliant. So yeah, I'll go Will Ferrell. Two votes for you, Will Ferrell. Wonderful. Not everyone makes it in acting, and 
my sense of you is um, you. Uh, Oh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know you've been back and forth between New Zealand because you know a, a girl's got to make a living, and you know I know you've been Celebrity Treasure Island, you've been Ridden the Stars, the Broken Wood Mysteries, um, Snack Masters, all of these things. My favourite, by the way, is um, Deathgasm. We might come back to that. <laughs> I want, I'd like to talk. I'd like, but but and and so you know it, it is it is a it is a um, I think the word is a graft. I mean it is it is hard and for every Taika Waititi or Reese Darby or Martin Henderson I, I'm working on the assumption you know better than me there are hundreds that have um, have tried and it just hasn't quite uh, sort of worked out I mean run me through that yeah I mean it's statistically the odds aren't in my favor but I will say that knock on wood, I haven't had to have another job thus far, you know, so I just, you got to find a way to make it work. Yeah. Have I had a job that offers me or affords me an island and a private plane? No, but I don't really need for that as long as I can feed myself. And there have been times where I haven't been able to do that and I've had to stay in my car or eat cereal for every meal. Yeah, but life is hard. Everyone goes through employment struggles and hardships, whether it's, and it's not always a lack of efforts um no it's not or talent or talent yeah part of its luck timing could be the silliest thing so see i don't I, you know I, I don't think i could do it because again i have no idea about the acting would actually have this is not true i have a sister-in-law who went to top drama school in london and awesome. she you know she did all right she got some parts she was in the theater she um uh, uh, she had big ads in the UK, you know, that pulled some money and kept her going for a while. Now she's a mother of two children in PR, right? Mm-hmm. And that's just because, it's not because she wasn't excellent. It's because, um, you know, it's not like law, which I did, where you can be average and things will go well. You know, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's luck, it's all these things. I couldn't do it because I sit there and say, I'm not going to auditions every other week. And having people personally judge me and say, you know what, um, that's you. You weren't good enough. Goodbye. Now I know it's a bit more than that because you know maybe they maybe they needed a brunette for that one, or maybe you know mm-hmm. the pies, the number of pies I eaten. I mean, I wasn't quite right for that stunt double part or whatever. Yeah. But um, I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Of course, anyone in the arts is like choosing. <laughs> I mean. It's- I'm a comedian, uh, a comedic actress with depression. It's like, it's not an original take, Kim, you know, like, yes, of course, what I've chosen as a career has caused me immense amount of pain and torture and depression and sadness. But this is where my talent lies. Like, I'm mm. good at this and I know I'm good at it. And I love doing it so much that I would be equally as miserable or I'd be more miserable if I was pursuing something that didn't bring me that joy. Like with the high highs and the low lows, I still wouldn't choose. And I, this was my first introduction to therapy is a a lot of my issues are tied to what I do for employment. Yeah. I seek all my validation from someone saying, we're going to pay you to do this skill because it allows me to go, okay, I'm not completely crazy, crazy in parentheses, because obviously I have a mental illness, but meaning like I'm not just, throwing money away, having an apartment in Santa Monica and paying for acting classes and coaches. And, you know, there's been enough times that I've been validated by someone willing to pay me for my services above everyone else that I was competing with that gives me the validation. I go, okay, I can do this. I'm going to do this and I'm going to have an amazing time. So as long as those things keep happening and there have been long seasons of unemployment for me, where of course you go within yourself, you go, maybe I don't have it anymore. Maybe I should choose a safer path. Mm. I think because I don't have any dependables or dependents, I have my animals. Mm. Um, But apart from that, I'm not in a situation where I'm trying to feed a family. Mm. Um, It's really only my lifestyle and how I choose to, 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 pursue it that hinders from seasons of unemployment and i don't want i don't want to push it because you've actually given you've given a great answer to that and i admire you for it and what you're doing but i I just say you know when i think of you and i think of what you've said 
you've acknowledged, you know, actually you have, I think you've talked about as situational depression, right? It mm-hmm. comes from what you do and the highs and lows and difficulties of that. I was listening um, before the pie uh, on the way here to talk to you to a Graham Norton podcast uh, mm-hmm. with a woman called Elizabeth Day. Mm-hmm. And he talked about, um, he basically had to set up, and I'm not suggesting you, you, you have failed at any level, you're a, a, a great success, but he talked about his failures. And his first one was he felt like he was a failed actor, mm-hmm. right? His third one, his middle one, was he couldn't throw a ball, right? And we, that, that, oh, I can't either, so I'm, I don't count. Neither can I. Yeah, yeah but, but that's that's why we went into politics and acting, right? Yeah. And then the third one was that he didn't make it in America, right? His his um, talk show flopped, or it didn't flop. It just you know he, big pressure didn't go didn't go there, and and he came back uh, to the UK. But his first one was kind of like. You know, I felt like I was a failure. He went to drama school. He wanted to be an actor. He had a little, I think it was Father Ted and Father Ted very briefly. It just wasn't working. Um, he, he then, of course, got into these other things. And it was only when he realized, actually, that that was my dream. But now I'm in my dream. I wouldn't go back for quids. And I just say all this to you. Mm-hmm. And my last go at this, so don't worry, it's in terms of, you know, the serious sort of deep kind of stuff. But um, it seems to me you are, you are, Huge in New Zealand, you um, could easy walk in and be running X Y Z show and earning great money and da 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 da, and yet you continue with this hard, less travelled path uh, in LA, which seems to me, yep, I, I, you were saying it's gone well, and tell me about that if you like, but has its real um, crunchy, tough stuff as well. Yeah, pretty sadistic, eh, to like, (laughs) why can't I just be happy with the status quo? Um, But I think that's my personality, you know. I I like things to be a little bit difficult. I really do. I think that I know what's on the other side of it, and at the very least it's an element of personal growth. I don't Mm -hmm. mind things being challenging. I come from, in fact, I usually seek out those kind of opportunities because I come from a very beautiful, not without its own trauma, but childhood. And I have a family full of love and delight that it fills me with the confidence to go and seek out these more difficult opportunities, whether that be traveling alone, traveling to third world countries, like putting myself out there. I also am not really afraid of dying. So I feel like I have this element, the sadistic element of like, I can be rejected. I can be in an unsafe place. And if it ends, then hopefully I go out in a great spectacular way. But I just, I don't have that fear about my own mortality or about my own ego. I think I'm more afraid of myself and my brain. So it's my own self-deprecation that I struggle with more than anything. Mm. So to put it on something external, like chasing a dream in LA or in Hollywood, that journey is tough, but it's also exciting. Where I find my real struggle is just my own narration of my life going on in my head that that is my battle Hmm. so yeah and I I don't know if people can relate to that I'm kind of choosing like outward going and doing things is not scary to me I'm sure many can thank you like content the idea of people seek seeking to find that word content that is the scariest place for me a place where I'm stuck and not growing and not thriving and not experiencing that is terrifying to me. Mm. Doing the same thing every day feels terrifying to me. But mm. going and just spinning a wheel every morning and being like, what will today bring? That level of chaos is where I thrive. So I'm happy there. <laughs> and what is to, what does t- today bring? What have you got going on right at the, the moment? Goodness. So this morning I had to wake up to do a rehearsal with a company I'm working with who are in um, – Israel at the moment. So I had a rehearsal for that this morning. Um, I picked someone up from the airport. I had a very delightful sushi lunch. I went to the beach. I went to the gym. I went to the chiropractor. I've done an audition. Now I'm chatting to you. And then tonight I'm a horrible cook. So I might like heat up some soup and drink some wine and watch The Bachelorette. <laughs> <That's my day. laughs> Brilliant. Um, I mentioned yeah. Deathgasm, so I do just want to go there. Um, yeah. I, 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 two, 
teenage boys, I think, unwittingly who unwittingly summon an ancient evil entity known as the Blind One by delving into black magic while trying to escape their mundane lives. Mm. Career highlight? Honestly, yeah. I got to go to Austin. <laughs> it was like, it's like got a huge following. I'm a meme from that film. <laughs> It's just funny, like my life is so funny because I get thrown into these situations that are usually outside my comfort zone, but I learn a lot. So that was a real crucifixion by fire in terms of the, <laughs> the, the world. It sounds blasphemous. It was. That's the you point. You need a deliverance. Oh, I, um, oh, I did. <laughs> um, I, I, I do just want to, because we've 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 touched on it and um, or we've alluded to it. I mean, your podcast is pretty depressed. Anyone who hasn't checked it out, it's amazing. And what, what impressed me? Many things impressed me. Many things impressed me about you in general. But cool. um, sixty episodes. You you know you were a veteran podcaster. I think you know. We, well, I won't name a number, but we we haven't got that many. Yeah, but you'll get there. Look at your. I know that this is all about me, but let's just turn it back on you a little bit. You're a very talented, well-researched man who's doing something that's super exciting and hosting and holding space for interesting conversations. So Hmm. you'll get your 60 episodes. May you, should that be what you want to do? Because people want to hear what you have to say and the questions that are interesting to you. So, Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Your podcast there is no such word as learnings, okay? I know you're in America where it was probably invented. It's not a real word. It's lessons, okay? So what have been the lessons for you from doing your pod? Like, and I know there's like 18,000 if you went through, but, you know, at a a really high level, when you think about what you're doing and what you've got out of it. I think I've learned that so many people are going through interesting things and have had their own traumas that if you ask interesting questions you get interesting answers I think it's taught me to be a better conversationalist in life that there's no boring people you're just asking boring questions so you can really find out really interesting things about all people I feel like I feel like you're pointing a number of fingers at me here. Not at all. You're doing a wonderful job. These are what I learned from it. And I learned that, and I said this earlier, two of my biggest takeaways is what you don't deal with will deal with you. So whatever it is that's bubbling away, if you don't give it the time, it will find a way whether it presents itself in the form of burnout, exhaustion, anger, rage, addiction, like whatever you don't deal with inside you, it'll find a way to come up. So do the work. And my second thing is to be where your feet are. I spend so much time because I want to just live the fullest life, living in the future and planning that I'm I'm not the most present human for the people that show up for me, my friends and family. And I have to be better about that. Like even sitting across from the people I love, I can so often be in my head and kind of like willing them to finish what they're saying. Let's keep, keep it moving forward. And that's just my own projection and own anxiety. So I just have to learn to be where my feet are. And right now that is here with you. But I, I, because, you know, we're also recording, we're doing this kind of thing. So I need to translate that to the people that I care about because I find myself being the worst version of myself with the people that love me unconditionally. And that's something I want to change just because they love me unconditionally. And I know that they'll love all versions of me doesn't mean that they should get the worst of me i shouldn't save the best of me for the people i don't know and i tend to do yeah so yeah i i i absolutely know and respect the uh, the sentiment there and they're great lessons even learnings maybe um I, I didn't intend to but you've gone there a couple of times and so it's obviously something that you know you 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 think about that is there for you and that's spirituality and you've uh made clear you've dabbled in christianity we're all on a journey yeah uh tell tell us about your journey i i think religion is and spirituality play such an interesting role and it's very individualistic i would never wish to push or pull anyone in any direction i think that in I spent a lot of my life alone in different countries. I really, I grew up in a school that was Anglican. I like the ceremony of um, having a lesson or a token or learning for the week, whether that be in a sermon or a speech. 
And I've also traveled the world and seen other amazing ceremonies that have a religious undertone. So I I'm super open to trying things. I love, I've got some sage in the corner here. Like whatever works for you, I think is great as long as it's not causing harm to anyone. Mm. Um, But I think for me and what faith looks like, again, very individualistic, I, I really feel or whether I'm making it up or what, I really feel the presence of my Nana with me a lot. And that really helps me through um, and my pets as well. Um, and I do pray a lot. Some people would call it meditation. I don't necessarily address it to a God. I think I just like address it to the universe and it's a form of therapy for me to get it out of my body and say words and what I need and just to grant me strength, grant me some patience, whatever it might mean. Um, and I feel in a really cool place with it. And so, um, I think it only becomes problematic when people ruin things because people are faulty and people are flawed. So you usually lean on those kind of things when things aren't going your way. And I always feel like when I'm in a pickle, I feel like that's when I need, when I can't find it within myself or I can't find it within my peers. I'm like, I don't know if there is anything out there, but if there is, please, I promise that I will do better next time. Help me through this. And I find myself doing that a lot, especially here in L.A. because I'm alone and it can be really scary. You know, people are carrying guns most of the time. I live alone. People are getting shot at schools down the street. I'm not home. I'm not in New Zealand. And so even feeling like if there's something out there that can help protect me, that feels really helpful to me. For sure. Um, There's no convenient segue to what I'm about to ask you. Just do it. Take a left turn. Tarantulas. <laughs> that could be spiritual. Maybe what, God what, comes in the what, form of a tarantula. What we, what, what's, God, what's, Yahweh? You, you, you have one? I have one. Do you want me three, to bring in? five? Sure. I have one. Sure. Okay, hold Is on. Is he close see. by? He's right here. Okay, um, you know, I, because I am a broadcaster, now is my time to say Kim has elegantly left oh, yes. her chair and walked away from the camera to retrieve a brown and white well, tarantula. He's, actually, he's called a red hair, so he's oh. kind of gingy. But is that good? He is a he. Well, you know what? How very, how very twenty two of me, twenty twenty two. Because of his size, it, he probably is is female, just because of his um, really large abdomen. But I was obsessed with Prince Harry prior to all the drama, and he's a red haired <laughs> spider. So I was like, his, and he should have a full name. So his name is Prince Harry O'Connor, and he's my pet. Does, and I love him. Is he dangerous? Yep. I mean, he's a tarantula. So Which yeah. is what, he's how, a... I'm serious, my ignorance of, I need my 10-year-old son here who probably. No, you're fine. So, yeah, I mean, he would do a lot of things before he would bite me. He would use these back legs to shed hairs, and that would be a warning that he's unhappy. Um, and, yes, he could bite me. He could latch. They are venomous. But. Animals are much easier to read than people, hence why I'm obsessed with well, them see, because they're predictable. See, I can understand a dog, and you know, each to their own. We live in a world that's very relativistic, oh. and we're all allowed our own things, and we're individuals. And you're in America, the land of the free. But <laughs> I just sit there, and I don't see an attraction with a tarantula. I say that with due love and respect. Okay. What do you get back from Harry? Well, it's. Just putting the lid on. Um, tarantula drops on for- floor <laughs> no, no. and runs <laughs> off to ah. local local primary school school uh, to attack children. No. So we, I feel like I am in the pursuit of a very selfish career. I'm doing it because I enjoy it and it makes me happy. I feel that it's really important for me to have things to look after and take care of. And when you're traveling a lot, a pet like a tarantula is really convenient. It's not like a goldfish or a betta fish. He can be fed once a month and he would be fine with that. He doesn't need much care, but it's still something for me to take care of. 
Um, I'm a very acts of service type person. So I need to be looking after something to make myself feel good as well. And so he was my first pet in LA. I now have, I have two rescue cats here um, as well who haven't yet shown up, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, it really came from that selfish thing of wanting something to take care of. And you know what? It also makes me pretty edgy. Like, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a ferret on your um, shoulder, you know? You, there's those it's a pr- girls who walk around with the weasel or the ferret or whatever it is. You've, got a, you've gone one step further. You've got a freaking tar- a tarantula. And I love that it makes people lean in a little bit. Like, that's a bit weird. And I'm like, let me, great. Let's go down this path. Because on its surface, I'm a pretty girl with long blonde hair and a nice smile like we've all we know a thousand of those but then you go she's got a tarantula and you go hold on a minute this just got weird and I love living (laughs) in the weird space so you know and I love I love ugly things like I have real empathy for the stuff that doesn't get the spotlight because I get it with such ease and such delight that I love when I get to bring my tarantula in or talk to you about some weird fish that I've discovered. So that kind of started this marine biology journey of like, I just want to like learn about all the stuff that's not getting talked about. We love dolphins. We love bears. We love lions. Well, let me tell you about a giant burrowing cockroach. Let's make them cool. They're doing the heavy lifting. So yeah. Kimberly Francis Crossman, I think you are strange. I know. Great. And and I say that, I say that as a compliment. I don't. I don't mean that in any way. I. I think you know. I, I think there. There is. There is a lot going on. And um, I, I think no. <laughs> don't let me qualify this. And, and I think to. we are I better, and you are better, better for that. And and what what you know you've told us uh, here is is you know you are on a life less ordinary, and yeah, it's got its issues and its problems, but you know, it's never boring. And um, Harry, I think, uh, sitting there in the corner knows that as well. I'm gonna wrap up by asking the questions I ask every guest that we call this section general knowledge. Firstly, what single object would you save from your house? Can I get it? Yeah. You 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 are the most interactive guest I've ever known. I mean, she's she's bouncing up and down. She's gone. I'm looking at no, she's back. Didn't take long. Oh, so this is my first ever. I just want to say no. It's a koala that says I love New no, Zealand. No, it's a teddy bear. <laughs> it's not a koala. No, it's not a koala. Yeah, right. And it needs a clean, but that's part of it. This is my first teddy bear. His name is called Little Morgan because my sister got one that was bigger, and I copy everything she does because she's fantastic. So she called hers Morgan. Little Morgan, and I would save him because, like, isn't he just delightful? And I don't have precious things. I mean, I'm an actor. <laughs> I eat cereal and soup. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's very precious. What's the best night out you have ever had? The best night out that I ever had. Oh, it was. <laughs> it's best because it's funny. I mean, it's horrible. But um, after Treasure Island. It was right as America's Cup was happening. I exclusively, if I'm going to go out or do something, I only go out with my family. That's just a rule that we have because I'm obsessed with them. And if I'm going to drink, I need my parents there as witness. Um, (laughs) So I went out after Treasure Island. So I've had only beans and rice for 17 days. Go out. It's America's Cup. I try something called an Aperol Spritz. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this alcohol. Yeah, lovely. I'm new new to drinking because I was sober for seven or eight years. And so I'm back on giving it a nudge. Mm. Um, and so I was having Aperol spritz and then espresso martinis and other things. And I was like, oh, going to chunder. So I started throwing up at, I'm going to call it like four o'clock in the afternoon down in the viaduct. The cops came, like, and all my ex boyfriends I just been, don't, I can't see you oh, chundering. I'm an aggressive spewer. Like, there's no vomit that doesn't come with tears. And I was just, because <laughs> I had eaten food and drunk. Like, my body was like, whoa, we haven't done this in a long time. But my parents had to take me home. Yes. Thank goodness, as they did. But at every traffic light, I had to stop and spew out the car. Um, and then at one traffic light, I forgot to open the door and spewed in that trough area. You know, the back seat where you put rubbish. 
<laughs> Which is like, <laughs> oh, this is this so is I, I, this and, is good. Oh, and then I guess I got home, and then kind of continued just feeling the gut. Eventually, got to bed and woke up the next day with my mother saying, "Kimberly, Kimberly Francis, you need to go and hose down the driveway. It's um, getting hot out, and there's an odor." So at some point, my beautiful mother had like, "What sort of mother is she? She's phenomenal. Does she not well, love you. She cleaned up the spew in her car." which was in that trough. So okay. that's got to be like, how do you even do that? You've almost got to get like a cup system, or like a splash out <laughs> method. Like how do you get in her car still? There's a, there's a dead ant aroma almost a year. It was a year later now in her car. Still, you can't get rid of. Um, and I just had to stand there like hung over hosing down the driveway. But that was probably my best night out recently because apparently I had a great time and I didn't have to clean up the vomit apart from a bit of like <laughs> And so many people saw me that it's comedic. You know, when you want to look good oh. for ex-boyfriends, I have one ex-boyfriend that I still just, I wish he would acknowledge my brilliance, but I just always seem to do the, like, be so clumsy and dumb around him. And the fact that he just saw me keeled over with the police going, (laughs) 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 of course that happened. That that would have been a great meme. Speaking of memes, that was amazing. You can take it. I love that. No, that's, thank you very much. What's the best advice given to you? And you've had a lot of it and some of it's been bloody good. So yeah, best advice. Who? I think, I, I think I said it earlier and just because it's so in the chapter I'm thinking of, it was it was by the offensive line coach of the Green Bay Packers, who is a so a sports coach. And his advice was just be where your feet are. And that's just something I have to con I should get it tattooed on me, but I just yeah, that's the hardest thing for me is to just be present and it's where all our joy and delight comes from. So that's probably my best advice. We've talked Shortland Street, tarantulas, um, chundering Aperol spritz. Um, Kim Crossman, really appreciated it. You've been listening to Generally Famous. There are more episodes at stuff.co.nz slash generally famous and wherever you get your podcasts. If you follow us on any of the podcast apps, you'll get instant access to the next episode. It's quick and easy to do. Thanks very much to producer Chris Reed. I'm Simon Bridges, and this is Generally Famous. It's been great to have you along. Generally Famous is proudly brought to you by Trade Depot. Generally famous for low prices, always.